this evening, we are very pleased to have the opportunity of becoming acquainted with someone who has been both successful as a teenager and as an adult. During high school, our speaker won a DAR Good Citizenship Award. She was also selected to attend Girls' Nation in Washington, D.C., where she visited the White House and met the President of the United States. In addition to being valedictorian of her graduating class, she was also voted the most outstanding student in her senior class of 900. Our guest was selected as May Queen and had the lead role in her senior class play. At the University of Colorado, she was one of two girls voted to the highest student government position and selected as a delegate to two National Student Association conventions. A year later, after being selected Miss America and serving in that capacity, she returned to the University of Colorado and graduated with Phi Beta Kappa honors. A very avid sportswoman, she has competed in national AAU swimming meets, trained her own horses, competed in golf tournaments, and she raced for the University of Colorado ski team. Our speaker has received standing ovations from coast to coast as a keynote convention speaker. As United Airlines youth speaker, she will speak to over 75,000 teenagers this year. We are very grateful to United Airlines for making her appearance here this evening possible at this 25th annual National Junior Achievers Conference. And now, here she is, Marilyn Vanderbur. I'm delighted to be here with you tonight. I was so pleased when I was asked to be a part of your Junior Achievers Conference, and thank you, Chris, for that very nice introduction. You know, you never know exactly what kind of an introduction you're going to get. I spoke to a student council convention in Texas last spring, and when the boy stood up to introduce me... Well, he must have thought that it was his one big chance, because his introduction lasted longer than my entire speech. I mean, I thought he was going to tell everybody how many cavities I had. There was a fact that he left out. I guess it's something that I really hadn't thought about myself. I found out about it one Saturday last fall when I was taking a drive through our beautiful Colorado Rockies. I had the top down on the car, and I had my hair back in a ponytail. But when it was finally time for lunch, there wasn't a restaurant in sight. Well, I kept looking and watching, and finally, I saw an old, old log cabin type restaurant tucked way back in the pine. So I went in and I sat down. Well, the owner and the sole occupant came over and sat down with me and told me his whole life story, how he'd spent 55 of his 72 years right there in that log cabin restaurant. And then he kind of looked at me and he said, you know, you favor that Marilyn Vandiver, that Miss America. I kind of shook my head and he said, yes, you do. You favor her. I said, I'm too old to be a Miss America. And he said, well, she's no spring chicken. <laughs> oh, it's sad, but it's true. <laughs> I think I had a little better understanding of how Bess Meyerson must have felt when her daughter came home from school one day and said, Mother, are you really the oldest living Miss America? <laughs> Well, needless to say, it was a fabulous year. I traveled over 150,000 miles, visiting as many as 20 cities in 30 days. And it was during that year that I found that no matter where you travel throughout America, people are wonderful. I'll never forget one night, I arrived in Philadelphia very late. It was pouring rain outside. We didn't get to the hotel until about 3 o'clock in the morning. But nevertheless, the manager of the hotel was there to meet us present me with a lovely bouquet of roses and make sure that we were very comfortable in our hotel suite. Well, I happen to remember that night in particular because we didn't get to bed until about 3.30 in the morning and we had an early flight out, which meant there wasn't too much time for sleeping. Well, I remember I stayed in bed until I had exactly 20 minutes to eat, pack, and get dressed, which I can do if everybody leaves me alone. So at 7 o'clock sharp, I jumped out of bed and started rushing around the room. Well, about that time, the maid came in. Well, I thought it was awfully funny of her to be cleaning up at that early hour, but we exchanged good mornings and went about our business. I was rushing from my cereal to the suitcase, and she was ripping sheets off the bed, putting clean towels in, 
polishing the mirror. I really don't think that she would have even noticed me if we hadn't literally collided several times in the middle of the room, but finally I was already to go and I said goodbye. She looked up at me just in time to say, dear, I'm terribly sorry to be rushing you out like this. I know that you have an early plane to catch, but I had to come to work early this morning and get this room spick and span. You know, Miss America's arriving today. Well, I chuckled to myself and I told her I knew Miss America would appreciate all of her personal interest and then I scurried out the door to catch the plane. I thought that it was an amusing experience. But it also brought home a very important point. And that is that the wonderful people throughout America had been meeting not an individual girl, but a Miss America, a symbol, a representative. And that's what each one of you here tonight is, a representative, a delegate. You've been selected from the many. You are among the few. And whether you realize it or not, younger boys and girls look up to you. They look at what you wear and how you wear it. They listen to what you say and how you say it. I'm sure that in addition to being outstanding in junior achievement, you're also outstanding in your schools, in your churches, in athletics. This is what you are today. You are potentially the college graduates, the business and civic leaders of tomorrow. But will you be? I believe that you can and will be anything in the world that you want to be. But what is it that you're seeking from life? Have you thought about it? What are your goals and your dreams? Recently, I emceed the Miss Arizona pageant. I was the local Burt Parks. And when it came time to ask the final five their questions, one of the questions was, and what is your goal in life? I'll never forget the way one girl responded. She concluded her answer by saying, and my goal in life is to be happy. Might this be your goal in life, to be happy? I suppose everyone wants to be, but can you look for happiness? Do you find it in someone else's company or at a party? No, happiness comes from within. We can share happiness, but no one can give it to us. We have to find happiness by ourselves, all alone. It seems to me that the purpose of life is to matter, to be productive, to be someone, and to do something, not just to look like something. What do you want to do? What do you want to be? What do you want to excel in, music, politics, athletics, art? How high are your goals? President of the student body? Star football player? Homecoming queen? Or would you like to paint like a Michelangelo? Or write like a Thomas Carlyle? Or contribute to our society like an Alexander Hamilton? Do you believe that this would not be possible? Do you believe that each one of these men was born to be a genius? If you do, then let's listen to what they had to say. Michelangelo, if people knew how hard I work to get my mastery, it wouldn't seem so wonderful after all. Thomas Carlyle, genius, is the capacity for taking infinite Pains. Alexander Hamilton, all the genius I have is merely the fruit of labor. They spoke about work when they talked about genius. Or how many times have you attended a conference of this kind or a high school assembly and you watched a boy preside and you said to yourself, I could do just as well as he does if I had just been born with his natural ability to communicate with a large audience, to stand up there with confidence. Is it natural ability? I'm sure I thought it was until I met a man by the name of Bob Richards. Does the name Bob Richards mean anything to you? He's a former Olympic champion. He talks about Wheaties on television. Well, he's also one of the finest public speakers in America today. And he was addressing a large high school assembly one day and he just 
challenged them, and he motivated them. And when he finished, the whole student body stood up and gave him a standing ovation. And as he turned to leave the auditorium, a high school sophomore boy ran after him and he said, Mr. Richards, why, I said, I've seen you on television. By the way, you challenged each one of us here today. He said, I'd give anything in the world if I could speak in public the way you do. I'd give anything if I had your talent. And Bob turned to the boy. And he said, if you would really like to be a fine public speaker, then go out as I did and give 7,000 speeches. Bob spoke about work while the boy spoke about talent. Dave Diedrichson. Dave once said, before I was even in my teens, I knew exactly what I wanted to be when I grew up. My goal was to be the greatest athlete that ever lived. She didn't say she'd try basketball and see how she did, and if she didn't do too well, she'd try something else. She didn't say she'd try out for the softball team, and if she didn't make it, she'd quit. She said, before I was even in my teens, I knew exactly what I wanted to be when I grew up. My goal was to be the greatest athlete that ever lived. Have you read a record? All-American in basketball, All-American in softball, national championships in track and field, the first woman in Olympic history to win two first place gold medals. Did she rely on natural ability? but well, let's look later in her life. You may remember that she decided to take up golf. Before her very first tournament, she practiced 12 to 16 hours a day. She would drill and drill and drill on all the different shots until her hands were blistered, many days bleeding. She went on to win every available golf tournament, but the secret of her success 12 to 16 hours of practice a day. Is it genius? Is it talent? Is it natural ability? It's work, desire, discipline. It's having a definite goal that you want to accomplish by a definite date. I wonder how many young girls say to themselves, if only I were prettier. And yet, what does this have to do with happiness or accomplishment? Let's compare the lives of two women. The first, a young Hollywood movie star, considered by many to be the most beautiful young woman in America. The second, an ugly duckling. A girl who grew into womanhood being shy and awkward and withdrawn because she knew she was so unattractive. The young Hollywood movie star couldn't face life enough to even want to live it. Marilyn Monroe, the ugly duckling, became known in her lifetime as the first woman of the world. When Eleanor Roosevelt was a young girl, her mother said, she's such a funny child, so old-fashioned, we always call her granny. She was only eight when her mother died of diphtheria, and her grandmother insisted that she wear flannel underwear, long black stockings, high lace shoes. She had braces around buck teeth and a brace on her back, and she was tormented by the feeling that she was odd and different. A beautiful young girl filled with grace and charm and confidence? Certainly not. In fact, she wrote in her autobiography, about the only value the story of my life may have is to show that one can, even without any particular gift, overcome obstacles that seem insurmountable. That in spite of timidity and fear, one can find a way to live widely and fully. She found that way to become known in her lifetime as the first woman of the world. Is it genius? Is it talent? Is it natural ability? Is it natural physical appearance? It's work, desire, discipline. It's having a definite goal 
that you want to accomplish by a definite date. I wonder how many young boys say to themselves, if only I were taller or faster or stronger. Have you read much about the past Olympics? It's fascinating reading. In the book, Heart of a Champion, the story of Harold Conley is told. He competed when the Olympics were held in Melbourne. And while he was there, he met a Czechoslovakian girl who was also competing. They met, they fell in love, they were married. Their international romance was a wonderful story. It made headlines all across the world. But the truly great story was that of a young boy who struggled and reached the top. If you had seen Harold Conley on that day waving to 100,000 cheering people. You would have thought it was the most glorious day of his life. There was a Russian on his right and a Russian on his left, but he was standing in the middle, holding the gold medal, the champion of the world. And what a physique he had. The bicep on his right arm measured 18 inches. But what you could not see was it underneath that red, white, and blue United States of America uniform dangling loosely at his left side was a left arm that was two-thirds the size of his right. As a child, his arm had been broken 13 times and it had never healed properly. He called it a crooked stump. Did he have the natural physique to become an Olympic champion? On the other hand, as a young boy, did he sit on the sidelines of life being embarrassed because he had what he called a crooked stump? No, he lifted weights. He did chin-ups, he did push-ups. And on that day, when he stepped into that seven-foot circle, 100,000 people waited in hushed silence. The two Russians had just broken the record, and they were far ahead. He put that crippled left hand on the handle of the hammer. He put his strong right arm on top of it, and he started swinging that 16-pound ball around till he got it going at a terrific rate of speed, and as he let it go, an instantaneous roar arose from that vast stadium, and Harold Conley lifted his strong right arm in triumph. Is it genius, talent, natural ability? Is it natural physical appearance or strength? It's work, desire, discipline. It's having a definite goal that you want to accomplish by a definite date. But I always feel if we would truly look to inspiration while doubting abilities and talents. Let's look at a young girl who, when she was 19 months old, had a sickness that left her deaf and blind. I can't even imagine living in a world completely dark and absolutely silent. You wouldn't know what you looked like. You wouldn't even know that people spoke to one another. Who could believe that this child from Tuscumbia, Alabama would graduate one day from Radcliffe College with high honors? Well, you know the story of Helen Keller. But perhaps there is one experience in her life that is not familiar to you. She never dreamed that she would be able to learn to speak until one day she learned that a young girl in one of the Scandinavian countries, deaf and blind, had learned to speak, and that's all she needed to know. She devoted the next three years of her life, day and night, to learning to speak. Practice, 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 unending interminable practice, enunciation, vibration, rhythm, control, tone, volume. The day finally came for her to give her first speech. She walked out on the stage in Montclair, New Jersey, not seeing, not hearing, but facing what she knew was a large audience and without question, the biggest challenge of her life, she said, I stood there for a moment, voiceless and trembling. And then she said, I forced a sound. It seemed to me like a cannon going off. But she was told later, it had been a mere whisper. 
she knew. She had been a miserable, epithetic failure. She said, I came off that stage in despair, my whole body heaving with sobs, my face deluged with tears, crying, I cannot do the impossible. But she summoned the courage to try again. She resumed the speech lessons and the practicing until she could say, I have a voice that ministers to my work and my happiness. It's not a pleasant voice, I'm afraid, but my struggle has strengthened every fiber of my being, deaf and blind, yet filled with desire and purpose. One of the interesting aspects of my year as Miss America was the fact that as I traveled, I had an opportunity to meet other Miss Americas, and we usually had an opportunity to at least sit down and have a cup of coffee and exchange experiences. Well, one Miss America tells a story about, well, I guess it's the most exciting experience that happens to any Miss America, and that's her homecoming. Now, this girl was not allowed to go home for two months while her hometown prepared. Well, you can imagine. How excited she was when the day finally came, when the plane circled the field, when it landed and the door opened. She couldn't believe her eyes. They had the red carpet. There was a huge orchestra playing, newsreels and photographers surrounding her. Her whole family was there. Her sorority sisters had driven 60 miles to be there. It seemed as if the whole city was there. But the highlight of that weekend was the fact that her university was also having its homecoming. And the chairman of the festivities came over to her and he said, what a thrill it would be if on Saturday night we could climax our big musical review by presenting our own reigning Miss America. Now, he said, there won't be any time for rehearsal. But if you'll just be backstage Saturday night at 10 o'clock sharp, we'll have everything ready. Well, at 10 o'clock sharp, she was there. It was a complete sellout. Thousands of people in the auditorium People standing up and back, her whole family was there. Every boy she had ever dated, which can be embarrassing. <laughs> All of her sorority sisters, and they were saying wonderful things like, well, I really don't know how she won in the first place. Has she changed? Has she changed? Well, she was going to show them that she was Miss America. Well, they built a beautiful white staircase, about 10 stairs, all shimmering in silver and gold. And the chairman said, we wanted to have someone escort you, but there really isn't anyone important enough. So as the choir begins singing, here she is, our Miss America, that's when you'll begin your regal descent down the stairs. Well, there was a complete blackout. The drum roll, the curtains parted ever so slightly, a spotlight just on her face. She was wearing the beautiful glittering crown, the Cinderella gown, the red velvet cape, the white satin heels, the long white gloves carrying the scepter with the white orchid and her chin held ever so high. And as the choir began singing, here she is, our Miss America, she began her regal descent. Well, that second stare just wasn't where she thought it was, and there she was, <laughs> Miss America. <laughs> You'll just never guess which Miss America that was. Well, my father was sitting in the 10th row. He thought he could get there in time to catch me, and he started running down the aisle with his arms outstretched. <laughs> Believe me, we were a family to remember, but after it was all over. My father came backstage, and he said, You know, Marilyn, everyone here tonight has learned something very important. You really haven't changed. <laughs> I wonder how many times we say to one another before an election or an exam, good luck. And yet, what does good luck or good fortune really have to do in the scheme of life? In 1955, a young girl from Manning, South Carolina, 
entered the Miss South Carolina pageant with all the hopes and all the dreams of every contestant. And it was narrowed from five to four to three to two. She was one of the final two, but she lost. Surely that night, she must have said to herself, I think I can. Because the following year, she re-entered the Miss South Carolina pageant and once again it was narrowed from five to four to three to two. And she won the title of Miss South Carolina. But the story doesn't end there. She went on to Atlantic City. She competed on Wednesday and Thursday nights. And on Friday night, she was to do her talent, of which she was to sing a portion. She woke up on Friday morning with laryngitis. She went to convention hall for the rehearsal. She walked through that auditorium, which is the largest room in America, up onto the stage, which is the size of three standard basketball courts, over to the director, and he said, can you go on? And she said, I'll try. The girl who failed in 1955, the girl who had laryngitis for her talent presentation in 1956, became Miss America of 1957. In my estimation, the most beautiful Miss America we've ever had, Marion McKnight. A young girl entered in Biloxi, Mississippi, and she lost. She worked hard for 365 days, re-entered the following year in Brandon, Mississippi, and was crowned Miss America of 1959, Marianne Mobley. A young girl entered in Arkansas, and she lost. She worked hard for a year, re-entered the following year, and was crowned Miss America of 1964, Donna Axum. A young girl entered in Arizona, and she lost. She went back for the second consecutive year, and she lost again. She went back for the third year. And you may remember seeing her on television, the ventriloquist, Vonda K. Van Dyke, Miss America of 1965. <laughs> Well, Von Decay entered a total of 13 pageants before she became Miss America. How do you think she might have felt if during that year she'd been walking through a large room and overheard a young girl say, oh, isn't she lucky? Is it luck? It's work, desire, discipline. It's having a definite goal that you want to accomplish by a definite date. But if we would really talk about failure, then let me refresh this man's record in your memory. 1832, lost job, defeated for legislature. 1833, failed in business. 1834, elected to legislature. 1835, sweetheart died. 1836, nervous breakdown. During the next 24 years, during the next 24 years, he was elected only once to Congress. And yet he was defeated for Speaker, defeated for nomination of Congress, defeated for Senate, defeated for nomination of Vice President, again defeated for Senate. Nine defeats out of 11 tries. 1860, elected President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. Is it genius, talent? Natural ability, is it natural physical appearance or strength? Is it luck? It's work, desire, discipline. It's having a definite goal that you want to accomplish by a definite date. You can do anything in the world that you want to do. You can be anything that you want to be, but your success or your failure will not depend on genius, talent, age, appearance, health, or luck. It will depend strictly on you. What is your goal? Think about it. It doesn't have to be a lifetime goal. Make one for the next three weeks, the next three months. Write it on a piece of paper. Place it where you can see it every single day. Have a goal. Have a dream. If you never have a dream, then how can a dream come true for you? America needs now. Tonight, this hour, this minute, more than it has ever needed before in its history. Young men and women with purpose, 
with dedication. And America is not made up of other people. It's your leadership, your energies, your abilities. At the end of World War II, in a tiny village in southern France, the peasants worked long and hard and reconstructed their village, which had been battered by shell fire. American soldiers helped them. And as they completed the last reconstruction, the small Catholic church in the town square, the final touch was the reassembling of the statue of their beloved Jesus Christ, which stood at the entrance. Stone by stone, they found all of the pieces except the hand. They held a meeting and considered making new hands and attaching them, but decided instead upon an inscription at the base of the statue. If you went to this village today, you would probably see the small Catholic church, the statue of their beloved, handless, Jesus Christ, with the inscription below, I have no hands but yours. America needs now more than it has ever needed before in its history, young men and women with purpose, with dedication, and America is not made up of other people. Not one of you has a definite goal to be accomplished by a definite date. Do you? You must. Because there are no hands but yours.